Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Nancy Dannison, and she's going to tell us about her near-death experience. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Peggy. I'm really happy to be here, and I have quite a story to tell. Okay, well, um, start wherever you like and take as long as you like. I am an attorney. I was an attorney for 16 years, the first time I died. I have died three times, gone into the afterlife three times. I've had three in-hospital near-death experiences where I got out of the body and wandered around the hospital. I've had multiple out-of-body experiences and I had a shared death experience with my mother where I you know, witnessed what she saw as she was dying. My first afterlife experience is what Ions would call transcendental. It wasn't about me. It was about information. I think because all my life up until that point, I had been a seeker. I, I had asked a million questions. I wanted the truth. I wanted the knowledge. And that's what I got during my experience. I was privileged to be able to have a mammogram at my law firm's office. <laughs> my partners, I was a partner in a 270 attorney law firm and we arranged to have a mobile mammography unit come to our parking lot. We had about 450 employees and any woman in the firm could you know, go out and get a mammogram. So I did. They called me a couple weeks later and said, we need you to come in for magnification studies and to talk to your surgeon. I said, my surgeon, I don't have a surgeon. They said, you do now. So I was scheduled for surgery because I had three areas of calcifications that were forming suspicious patterns. Ladies, not all cancers form lumps early on. Um, you need to have a mammogram to pick up the calcifications. But because I didn't have a lump for the surgeon to feel, you know, where to cut, a radiologist performed a needle localization procedure. That is where the radiologist takes a large bore needle with a wire inside of it and, and using a mammography machine that has you know, like markings on it to tell you how deep and how you know wide. Um, they stick the needle in and, and try to position the wire right into the tumor. I, because I had three lesions, the radiologist had to do the whole procedure twice. I had had nothing, this was at 10.30 in the morning. I had nothing to eat or drink since midnight. She used a local anesthetic on my skin. I found out later that I'm allergic to local anesthetics. <laughs> and she, because she did the procedure twice, she gave me two shots of it. I kept telling her that I was nauseous and sweaty and I felt sick and I was starving. I, mean, I was just hungry. She didn't realize that those were symptoms of anaphylactic shock and also very low blood sugar, blood sugar, both of which can kill you. So after the, after an hour, well, it was 55 minutes, um, and having taken by my count six to eight mammograms with that wire in my breast, um, the radiologist and the radiology technician left, left me alone in the room. I was sitting in a chair like this with my arms on the arms of the chair, the wire sticking out of my breast. I had hospital gown on. I was scared to death. My heart was racing faster than I thought was even possible for a heart to beat. And that scared me because I knew what it meant. And I kept trying to control my breathing to calm my heart down. My medical record says that I was left alone from 11.25 a.m. to noon when the doctor and radiology technician came back at noon. I was just getting back into my body. So I died some shortly after they left the room. I tried to get up to go yell out the door for a nurse to come in and help me, but I couldn't move. 
it took at least 20 minutes for my blood pressure to come back up to normal, probably longer than that because I was still trying to get my blood pressure up, you know, after they came into the room, but they, they didn't seem to notice I was dead. <laughs> I, like I said, I was panicking and my heart was racing and finally it stopped and I was so relieved that my heart had stopped pounding. The panic stopped. I felt great. Then I felt myself literally sinking down through my body, like coming out, like sinking. I could see the inside of my body as I was passing down through it. I got down to about the belly button level and I went whoosh out. And I was standing in front of this body going, gee, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> And I was in blackness for, for a few seconds. And then I saw a light in the distance. And I thought to myself, oh, I know what that is. I'm supposed to go into the light. As soon as I thought that, the light came at me. I spent quite a bit of time in the light by myself. I had no idea what had happened. It never occurred to me that I died. I was trying to make a diagnosis. So I was a health lawyer for 36 years, having had, having read you know, tens of thousands of medical records. And I know how doctors you know, do what's called a review of systems to figure out you know, where the problem is, you know, what's not functioning properly. So I did a review of systems and went, okay, no, I seem to have, I can think I'm more awake and more alert and more alive than I've ever been before. And I was getting that, wonderful bliss, you know, that everybody gets in the light. You know, the bliss was just pouring, pouring through me, kind of expanding my molecules. And eventually I felt I was pushing it back out to the source. And I didn't know what that was, but I started calling it the source. So I'm making this diagnosis. I seem to have, you know, I can think. I think I can see, but I can't, there's nothing here to see. I think I can hear, but there's nothing here to hear. There's nothing to smell. I clearly can't taste. I don't have a heartbeat. I don't, I'm not breathing. Uh, I don't have any pain. That was wonderful because I had been in pain every day, all day long for many, many years. I, without realizing I died, did realize that the things that I enjoyed about human life were over. The I no longer feel, you know, the caress of wind on my skin or the sun baking me. I was never going to eat food again and I missed chocolate. And I just kind of, I didn't regret that I wasn't going to have those things. I just kind of released them like, okay, wistful, like. All of a sudden I started getting what I call knowings. The answers to all the off the wall questions I ever asked in my life just started popping into my head. I call them knowings because unlike in human life where you have to learn information by reading or listening or you know, some external stimulus provides the information and you take it in through your senses. In the afterlife, all there is to know about a particular topic just downloads into your mind instantly. And that's what was happening to me. And it was complete with a sensation that I knew it. I had learned it firsthand. So all these knowings were popping into my head, all kinds of topics. Uh, they're all laid out in my books. One of the biggest knowings that I received was about humans. Because, you know, here I am in the light, and I'm still me. And I was saying that to myself, hey, I'm still me. And I had always thought that it was my body that gave me consciousness. And it was my body that had the personality. But I was still conscious in the light without the body. And I was the same person I'd always been. The only things that were missing were fear and you know, greed and jealousy and you know, a lot of the things that um, make human life very difficult. Those 
drives, those instincts belong to the body. And once the body's gone, those are gone. I was told very clearly that I was not my body. My body was a human animal. And I knew it was an animal. I was a biology major. Um, I have one degree in biology and another one in chemistry and another one in psychology. Uh, no, one degree in biology and chemistry together and then another degree in psychology and then a doctorate in law. So I, you know, I was aware the human was an animal. I received kind of like side-by-side -side comparisons of what animal traits are, what human animal traits are, and what my natural spiritual traits are. And it was a vast difference. I had kind of a mini life review because I was shown that Nancy's life had been driven primarily by fear. A lot of what I had done, a lot of the choices I made, a lot of the decisions I'd made were out of fear. You know, fear that I would be wrong, fear that nobody would take care of me, fear that nobody would love me, fear that, you know, I would lose clients, you know, just, you know, if there's anything to be afraid of, I was afraid of it. And I was ashamed. You know, I was ashamed that I had put so much emphasis on trying to be a success in humans' eyes. I also, in addition to the knowings, discovered that I had spiritual powers that I didn't have in human life. I could um, see through the back of my head for one thing. <laughs> um, and I could see, I could objectively perceive myself and see myself thinking and then step back and be a whole person in in front of myself and also behind myself, observing myself thinking. And then I could step back from that and I could be all me, observing all me, watching all me thinking. And each time I step back, and I did it over and over and over, each time I step back, I got a better and bigger and broader and more complete understanding of myself and of life and everything in general. I call that multiple simultaneous levels of awareness. I realized that uh, time did not exist, that you know where I was, it wasn't governed by time. Uh, I realized that obviously I could get information, you know, it was like at one time I had all the information of the source in my mind. I and I understood it all at the same time. I only remember tiny bits and pieces of it, but it's enough to fill five books. I saw through the back of my head, Nancy sitting in the chair in the radiology room with her arms on the chair, arms on the wire sticking out of her breast. And I looked at her, Peggy, and I said, I don't know what you were so vain about before. You don't look like much now. And I didn't care about her. I mean, here was this poor lady who carried me around for 43 years, who was terrified out of her mind, who had literally died so that I could go home. And I didn't care about her. And I was just so offended by that. I, then I kind of got an inkling that I might've died because I saw her down there in the men's locker room and I'm in the light. And I said, nah, I couldn't have died. I always heard you go through a tunnel into the light and I'm already in the light. I didn't go through any tunnel and boom, I'm in a tunnel. Just thinking the word tunnel created this tunnel. Now I didn't get the, the angel singing and the celestial, you know, environment and the, you know, the stars. I got dirt. I got a, dirt ground that was a road under a railroad trestle, stone walls that were dirty and looked like they were, that dirt or mud was used as mortar to hold them together. It looked like a scene from maybe the 1920s. It was at the time when there were already automobiles because this was, this was a, a road for an automobile to travel under the railroad trestle. I could smell the air. I could 
hear the insects. I could feel the humidity on my skin. It was absolutely real, as real as anything I'd ever experienced as Nancy. And I thought to myself, nah. So I'm going to do an experiment. My experiment was, I've also heard it called, uh, you know, described as a beautiful meadow. Now, I wasn't calling it death or the afterlife. I was just, I've also heard it called a beautiful meadow. And boom, I'm in a beautiful meadow. Purple haze mountains in the distance, sun's out, the birds are singing, the flowers are blooming. It's gorgeous. I can smell the flowers. I can feel the breeze. It was absolutely real, as real as anything Nancy had ever experienced. But I still wasn't convinced. So, I thought, okay, one more experiment. I'm just hallucinating all this. I must actually be back in the hospital and I'm on my way over to surgery. Boom, I'm a back in the hospital, walking with the nurse beside me over to surgery. And there's this like purple stripe on the hospital wall that, you know, this way to surgery. And I could smell the hospital smell. I could smell her perfume. I could feel my weight on my feet on the floor. I could feel the wire in my breast jiggling. It was absolutely real. And the word that came into my mind was manifesting. And I was told that the only difference between what is it I was experiencing in the afterlife with these three environments that I manifested and what's happening in human life is I wasn't fooled by it. I'm like, fooled by it? What do you mean fooled by it? You know, how can I be fooled by earth life? And I got this huge download of knowings about manifesting and about how we souls inside human bodies manifest a good bit of what human our human experiences. There are two big engines in life. One's biology, which is created by source and governs you know all biological nature uh, in accordance with the natural laws that source created. And humans evolved. I watched humans evolve from lower life forms. Uh, in accordance with the laws of biology. The other big engine is manifesting. And we literally create a physical reality our bodies experience. We do it alone and in conjunction with other souls inside other bodies or souls that are still in the afterlife. So I'm getting this big download about manifesting. It's blowing my mind. And then all of a sudden I see like five like stripes of light kind of over to my left. And I'm thinking, oh, this is a typical Danison moment. You know, I'm supposed to go into the light and I get five of them and I got to pick the right one. And a voice, not my own, comes into my head and says, and then I, I don't know whether they came out of the lights, whether the lights turned into them or whether I just suddenly noticed these five being like things under the lights. Um, and they were kind of shaped like that and glowed from within like a light bulb. They had no features. And I called them in my mind, energy beings. I later heard near-death experiences call them light beings. So I started calling them light beings too because they glowed like lights. They were my dearest, most beloved friends of all time. I had not seen anybody, anybody, any being, anything, any, anything before this. I wasn't met by my deceased father or, or grandparents or sister or, or anybody. You know, I, there was no welcoming party for me until I saw these five beloved light being friends. And I knew I was home when I saw them. They said to me, we ran ahead of the rest of us. And I knew when they said the rest of us, they meant what humans call God. They told me that um, they, they couldn't wait to, to hear you know, what happened. And so they, they were communicating with me telepathy, uh, with using telepathy. And they wanted to know, you know, tell us everything. And they told me that they thought it was hilarious that I had volunteered to come into human life into Nancy's body at the time I did because I always made a terrible human. And <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. 
<laughs> you know, it's true. I do make a terrible human. <laughs> so I then had a deeper life review with them. It was kind of like all the events of Nancy's life were on a huge bubble around me and they were sliding on the outside of the bubble. The, like the events were sliding on the outside of the bubble, kind of like um, when you see a soap bubble and you know sparkles kind of slide around and colors kind of slide around the outside of the soap bubble. That's what was happening. One of the beings was inside the soap bubble with me and I got the impression that that was the rest of me that the memories that I was not able to carry in Nancy were in this being that was beside me. The other, pardon me, it always tears me up. The other four light beings, I call them my light guys now. The other four of my light guys were on the outside of the bubble, popping into scenes from my life. They were able to get inside Nancy's life and experience what she was experiencing and they could do it either as me or they could do it as themselves. And they were just popping in and out, sampling my life to get a firsthand knowledge of what I had experienced. I was also kind of like going through um, a replay of Nancy's life. And I noticed that it included every single bit of sensory data that the body had taken in. Like I could remember flying and seeing all the, the skies I'd seen out the, you know, the cockpit of my little tiny airplane that I was flying. I could be inside other people in my life and experiencing the same event that I had experienced as Nancy while I was in the body. I could experience from their standpoint during this life review. I could feel their emotions, hear their thoughts. I could be them in the moment of that experience. And so I, I was privy to the repercussions that everything I'd ever done, said, thought, felt, and how they rippled through other people and how they affected other people. But it, I didn't spend much time doing that because I'm thinking, oh, I've been there, done that. More interesting to me was the fact that all these other lifetimes were popping into my memory. I had lived hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of other physical lifetimes throughout the universe, all over the place. And I remember every single one of them, every single moment, all the sensory data, all the thoughts, all the feelings, all the everything of every single one of them, all at the same time. And I was saying to myself, how could I? possibly have forgotten who I really am. How could I have forgotten all these life experiences? It, it, it just flabbergasted me. And while I was, you know, getting back memories of all these other lifetimes, I also got back memories of how and why I incarnated into Nancy, which wasn't anything like I expected and I hadn't believed in incarnation reincarnate or reincarnation or incarnation before I believed in incarnation because I was reared as a Catholic and I believe that God created my soul specifically for this body and that it would live forever after this body died it never occurred to me that it could possibly have lived before this body after I got back all these lifetimes I kind of felt like I was by myself and I realized I was getting more knowings and I, and I could direct what type of information I could get. I could focus my attention and intention on what I wanted to know about. And that's another one of our spiritual, what I call them spiritual superpowers. I was thinking, well, I don't know how long I'm gonna have access to this information. So I'm gonna ask the biggies. I asked, who am I? What is God? What's the purpose of life? Why was I on earth? Where's heaven? Where's hell? And what's the one true religion? Because as a Catholic, I've always been taught that Catholicism was the one true religion. Those seven big questions were answered. And they constitute the a good part of my first book, Backwards, Returning to Our Source for Answers. When I got those answers, Peggy, 
I was angry. It wasn't anything like I'd been taught in Catholic school. It wasn't anything like what my parents and the nuns and the priests had taught me. It wasn't anything like I had believed human life was like. I felt like, would did people think I was too stupid to understand this? You know, did people withhold this information from me because they didn't think I could handle it? Or, you know, why? Why was I not told all this information when I was in Nancy's body? And it was beautiful. It was simple. It was so, so, so much better than the beliefs I had before I died. I think in response to my anger about feeling deceived, Source showed me the entire history of Earth from its creation as a planet to its demise as a planet. And I don't remember how Earth ends, but I do remember saying to myself, oh, it goes just like Mars did. So whatever happened to Mars is going to happen to Earth sometime in the you know, distant future. This history and future of Earth was focused on how religions developed and why they, they are the way that they are. And I watched it with great interest to see how humans, primitive humans, struggled to control their fear. You know, they were totally dependent for survival on the wind and the sun and the rain and, you know, growing crops and catching fish and, you know, and they had no way to control those things. And they didn't understand those things. So they assumed they must be gods. And they applied the same type of thinking that applies in human life to these gods. So they started worshiping the wind and making sacrifices to the, the ocean and you know, trying to curry favor with these gods to try to get better crops and better lives and you know, fewer accidents and you know, fewer drownings. And religion just kind of progressed like that all throughout history human belief systems were like this. God's up here, humans are down here, and they had to figure out how to get up there, how to get up to heaven, how to get up to God. And they used the techniques that work with humans, buttering them up, um, making sacrifices, uh, worshiping, um, coming up with these ideas that certain behaviors uh, upset or angered the gods. And so they made up a bunch of behavior rules, <laughs> some of which are, I mean, we laugh at them now, but we have the same kind of ridiculous behavior rules now. I mean, when I was in Catholic schools, you know, we weren't allowed to eat meat on Fridays. I mean, do you really think the creator of the universe cares if a little girl eats meat on a Friday? I mean, you know, it's fear-based. It's all, it's all fear-based and it's pr projecting human ways of thinking onto God in the afterlife, you know, along the same theories of, well, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you're a human, the only framework that you have to, to understand things that are really outside of human life is to apply human thinking to them. But that human thinking is wrong. What I learned in the afterlife is this, not this, this. I, after I saw this history and future, um, I kind of met up with my light being friends again. And we went into, a, or I, yeah, we went into another phase or stage of the afterlife. Like I learned that the afterlife isn't like, you know, one place you're in heaven and that's it. It has stages just like human life has stages, you know, baby, uh, toddler, teenager, old guy. Um, the afterlife has stages like that too. And you get to pick, you know, what stage you want to be in. We, we can pick to be in the incarnation stage or the reincarnation stage. We can also pick to be in what I call the virtual reality stage. And that's what I went into next after the history. I was able to, actually I was told I had to learn and to remember and get comfortable with merging myself, my energy 
into my light being friends. You know, remember I said in my life review, they were popping into my life. I had to learn how to do that. And they told me telepathically that before we could go forward to the rest of us, I had to learn and be comfortable with being a multiple being entity. So I spent a lot of time like merging myself into one or more or all five of my light being friends and living snippets of their physical lives. And I could do it either as them or as myself. And so I, and I spent a lot of time doing that. It was, it was so cool. I mean, I just, you know, but then once I got to the point where I was comfortable with it, we moved forward through source's energy. And I, I came to know source as this huge energy field that has personality and character traits. And yeah, you know, there is, there's no visualization to it. I mean, there was, there was no visual aspect to my intimate knowledge of source, but that feeling of bliss that we get when we first enter the light and the afterlife, that's source, that's source's energy. That's how we experience source because it's primary character trait and characteristic is unconditional love. So my five friends and I were kind of like moving through the best I can describe it is like a Corona of the sun, you know, just through layer after layer of, of energy toward the core of this source energy source. I've heard other NDE ears describe it as, you know, like an ocean or through layers of stars or star fields, you know, there, like I said, there's no real description because it's not at all human like, but as I was moving through these layers of sources energy, I got to the point where I got to watch creation of the universe. I saw creation from before the universe existed. I watched, I felt, I listened, I participated in creating the universe. I saw source the energy field basically alone, exploring its own nature, um, you know, testing out what it could do and, and you know its limits. And one of the things it decided to do, and I don't know if this has happened many times or I just saw this once. Source decided to create a physical matter universe to explore. And it imagined and expelled huge quantities of energy within its own energy field, within its own self that evolved into what we call the universe. It you know, formatted this, this energy and then imposed what we call the laws of nature on it as ways for the energy to interact and to develop over time. And so everything in the universe evolved. Source did not create stars or planets or people or things. It just created the imagination and the laws of nature that then evolved into the physical universe that humans know today. I watched plant earth evolve again from dust and rocks. And I watched the laws of nature, like gravity and molecular cohesion and chemical reactions. And, you know, the, the rules of biology all come together to form this beautiful, verdant, green, amazing planet. I watched the creatures develop from, you know, basically chemicals. Um, I watched humans evolve from lower life forms and I swore to myself, I remember what the quote missing link is. Uh, there really isn't any missing link. It's just humans don't understand how humans developed. I had seen when I was watching the history of earth that there are three, the word that was used was epoch, E-P-O-C-H. There were only maybe a dozen English words used in my entire experience, and one of them was epoch. And I had seen in the history of Earth that it had 
it had three developmental stages or three epochs. We're currently in the second one. And the first one was when we had the humans that I watched develop from lower life forms. There were humans that existed before the species we have now. They existed in semi-sophisticated cities, you know, kind of like Atlantis, not Atlantis itself, but you know, kind of like that. And then all that civilization was wiped out and the earth was re-terraformed and humans started over again as a, as a species a second time. There's a, I was told and shown there's a third species of humans in the works right now. And it's not like you can tell who's, who's a different species. You know, maybe the DNA is, you know, like one, DNA pair or one you know matched pair of something different than the current species, but it's enough to to be called a new species if if it were ever studied and determined what those characteristics were. Anyway, I uh, watched all of this evolve and grow, and I was getting knowings like in my ear about what was happening. And I saw like TV chirons that run along the bottom of the screen during the news. I saw those up above the picture of creation that I was seeing, which was kind of like on a TV screen. I remembered creating the universe. I remember doing it myself. I remembered all those things that I was watching as Nancy, as myself, the spiritual being, and as source. And that freaked me out. How could I remember? And then I had this like awakening where I realized I'm source. I remember creating the universe because I'm source. I'm not just this little soul that used to live inside Nancy. I'm definitely not Nancy. I am the source and so are the rest of us. I watched source take its own self-awareness and create mental characters. And those mental characters are what N D E or C in the afterlife as light beings. And I, so I call them light beings. Source created these mental characters, kind of like a novelist creates book characters. And it put those characters into like little personalities. Each personality is different. It's partly Source's own character traits and partly character traits that source can imagine, but can't personally experience. And it allowed those light beings to then put part of their energy into physical matter anywhere in the universe. And it works kind of like how our dreams do. Um, humans don't dream, souls do. At least this is the knowing that I got. Um, and you know how in a dream, you know, you create a, there's a physical environment. There's a scenery there, you know, that physical environment dreamscape for source is the universe. And then you have these mental characters, these dream characters in your dream and all the characters and things and creatures and, you know, everything in the universe are sources, dream characters. And then you're always in the dream. You're inside one of those dream characters. Usually it's the same character you play during the day. You know, it's the same body you wear during the day. But you're inside a character looking out and interacting with the other dream characters in the dream and experiencing real emotions in the dream from inside the body, just like we're inside a body now during waking life. That's what Source did. And the reason we can do that is because we are Source. Source put its own self-awareness, its own consciousness through these light being personalities into physical matter so that it could experience 
everything that each one of these light beings could imagine from inside physical matter. Source has, is all knowing, has all the intellectual knowledge that could ever exist. What it felt was missing was the sensations. It wanted to feel the emotions and the sensations of all the things it could imagine. And I feel why. used. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. I feel no. used all of a sudden. You know what I mean? Like that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. So when I awakened and you know realized that I'm a source, I said, "You mean I'm just here for entertainment?" <laughs> that all that suffering that Nancy went through for all those 43 years was entertainment. I felt used. Yeah. And then this huge bolus of love engulfed me. And I became aware that I had it all wrong, that I was never alone. I was never Nancy. I was never cast out there having to work my way to heaven by following rules I didn't understand. And I didn't know if they were right anyway. I was never alone, never unloved, never forgotten, not for a moment, never anything but source, and that I chose to incarnate into Nancy, and I chose to manifest all those experiences she had, including the painful ones and the sorrowful ones, and I wasn't being used, I was choosing, and I expanded my myself from just the little soul that I had been inside Nancy to this huge volume of energy that I call source and I could feel the rest of us who were just like me and I had been saying ever since I watched you know the history of, and future of earth I had been saying to myself Somebody ought to tell those people down there. Yeah, you know, somebody ought to tell those people down there. And I was angry that, you know, I didn't know these things before I died. And I figured that there are other people down on earth who didn't know these things either. And so I thought the only right thing to do was for Source to tell those people down there. And the next thing I know, I'm back into Nancy's body saying, I didn't mean me. You know, I think so. <laughs> you tell those people. I don't want to do it myself, you know? And so I'm, you know, I feel like I'm literally in a whirlwind, you know, slowly going back to Nancy's body. And when I realized what was happening, I got the impression that I had accepted a mission to tell those people. So my mission was to tell my experiences and what I learned in the afterlife to anyone who would listen and to experience unconditional love on behalf of Nancy. So that Nancy could feel what I was feeling without her. So as I'm, you know, going back into Nancy's body, I'm memorizing, you know, I'm trying to memorize everything that I had learned, everything I experienced so I could tell those people. And my light being friends were like around me going, love is all that matters. Love is all that really matters. And I'm saying, shut up. I'm trying to memorize the stuff. <laughs> and they wouldn't and I wouldn't. And I remember as much as I could. I got it's back funny how we tell those voices to shut up, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I really would. Um, so I got back like into the proximity of Nancy's body. And I'm saying, I'm not going in there. I mean, it, her body was cold and wet and heavy and clay-like and smelly and disgusting. And I wasn't going in there. I wasn't going to give up the ability to float freely. I wasn't going to give up all the information I was trying to memorize. I wasn't going to give up being who I really am to go back 
to that little tiny personality that I used to be in Nancy's body. But I was going back anyway. And I fought it. So it took a long time. The radiologist and the radiology technician were already back in the room. So it was at least a half an hour later. And they had the mammography films up on the <coughs> view box back in the room. You know, reading them and the radiologist was was drawing a little diagram on the back of the radiology uh, mammogram films based to the surgeons basically saying cut here. And I slowly percolated back into the body. And at the point where I could feel like there was a space between my hearing and the ears and a space between my seeing and the eyes, I could just barely move the mouth. And I said, I passed out. And the doctor turned around and looked at me. She comes over and she says, do you know who you are? I said, oh, yeah, I know who I am. Do you know where you are? I said, mammo room. I could barely move the lips. And she said, do you know who I am? And Peggy, she was not only my radiologist for this procedure, she was a client. I was in a client hospital when this happened. And I said, you look familiar, but I can't place you. And that's when she knew I'd at least been unconscious. So they called a nurse from out in the hallway who came in and took my blood pressure. And this whole time I'm saying, I'm starving, I'm starving. And she took my blood pressure and I heard her say 60 over palp. And that means the top number was registering, the bottom number wasn't. Normal is 120 over 80. I was 60 over palp. A little while later, she took my blood pressure again, and it was 90 over 75, or 90 over 70, something like that. That second number was recorded in my medical record, because at that number, it's believed there's no brain damage. If they had recorded the first number, it would have been obvious that I had died and I had brain damage. And so they were doing, or the, <laughs> the doctor was doing, well, I taught all my doctors clients to do only document as much in your medical record as is necessary for continuity of care to cover your own ass in case of malpractice and to justify your billing code so they didn't put anything in there that could create liability for the hospital i mean if you're going to kill somebody don't kill the lawyer don't make it a lawyer for the hospital but anyway so um, the medical record says it took about another 20 minutes for my blood pressure to come up to normal and I'm still saying I'm starving. And I kept telling the nurse, you know, I've got low blood sugar, test my blood sugar. And she finally did. And it was 60 and normal is around a hundred. So she started me on an IV of dextrose, you know, which is basically sugar water. And believe it or not, Peggy, they shipped me over to surgery. Nobody seemed to care that I'd been gone. Now, I did not tell them that I died. All I told them was that I'd passed out. But it was obvious I'd been at least unconscious. And they just shipped me over to surgery anyway. Huh. I found it out seemed later, like you were critical. You would I think. Mean, uh, I found out later by reading my medical records. It took from 1994. This happened March 14th, 1994 to sometime in 2011 for me to get any of my medical records. I mean, I was the hospital's lawyer. They would not give me my medical records. The first time I asked the first time, a couple of months after I died and uh, they gave me my discharge instructions, a scheduling sheet, a copy of the surgical note. And that was it. I tried another six months later, they ignored me. I tried every year after that, they ignore me. In 2011, they give me like five sheets of paper all of which say edited in 2008. This was a 1994 event. They edited my medical records in 2008. But what they gave me included this record of this needle localization procedure. And um, the surgical note um, that I did find in surgery. In fact, I felt Fantastic. I mean, I've been in the afterlife. I felt great. And I'm in the 
surgery and I've got my arm out, you know, strapped down to a board so that I wouldn't move it, you know, while they were operating on my breast, but my hand was still free. And I said to the surgeon, aha, you think you've got my arm control? I can still pinch your ass. <laughs> I'm so, so you could tell I was in a good mood. Um, and after I got out of the surgery, the anesthesiologist brought me two Snickers bars. Um, they watched me like a hawk the rest of the day and then just sent me home. The next day, I flew to Baltimore and spoke to an audience, a national audience at the American Health Lawyers Association. Wow. It took 10 days for them to get my pathology report back to me. And one of my good friends was the head of the pathology department at this hospital, and she couldn't get my pathology report. So she finally did. And the diagnosis was, they had the, I guess, National Cancer Institute had just changed classification systems for various types of pathological findings. And, you know, you've heard of DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. I had ductal carcinoma in situ and lobular carcinoma in situ, and they did not have a classification for that. So they, they told me it was benign, but I had to have a mammogram every three months for a while. And then I was on, I, they put me on the exact same schedule uh, for monitoring a cancer patient that I've been on since 2011 when I got cancer in the other breast. The thing that I want people to understand, you know, when they watch, you know, these wonderful videos that you have on your channel is that near death and afterlife experiencers have brought the greatest gift of all time to us, to all of us. You know, the people who have told their stories about being out of body, about, you know, having near-death experiences and getting out and, you know, wandering around, they prove, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of them. They prove that the body does not give us life. The body does not give us consciousness. The body does not give us personality. We exist as eternal beings outside these bodies. We are privileged to live inside these bodies and to share a lifetime with a wonderful human being that a lot of times we mistreat or he or she mistreats himself or herself when we could be helping them out a lot more than what we do. We could be controlling their behavior. We can have a much better life, much better environment if we would just wake up and realize we're manifesting. We're manifesting a lot of what happens and we can manifest better. The people who, the near-death experiencers who cross over and go into the light prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is an afterlife, that there is more than just human life that we survive intact in another place, in another state of being. I, I did not experience heaven as a place. It's not a physical environment at all. I experienced it as a state of mind or like living in my mind. But these wonderful people who have told us their stories prove that that exists. I have, since I died, read maybe eight or 12 um, accounts of other people like myself who went further into the afterlife, who lived there longer, who experienced other stages of afterlife, and who all, every single one, agree that Source is not an old man with white hair and white skin uh, wearing long white robes. Source is energy. It's pure energy. That's all. It's energy with personality and character traits that is unconditionally loving and unconditionally accepting and allows the mental characters in its mind to choose their own lives, to choose whether to incarnate, to choose into whom to incarnate, what kind of life they're going to have. It's not source using us. It's source allowing us to use our imagination and to explore the universe.
I have a question. Said, yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying, but yet you were forced back against your will. Like, why well, didn't be the one to do this? Like, I just had the idea. Somebody should do it. And, you know, like you were forced back, but yet we're choosing this. So I'm kind of confused. I, I wasn't forced back. Um, I know it sounds like that because I wisecracked through my entire experience uh, in my own mind. You know, when I said, you know, I didn't mean me. Um, that's just my sense of humor. As source, you know, I was saying to myself as source, somebody needs to tell those people. And I decided to do it. And the handiest vehicle for doing that was the, the part of source that used to be in Nancy, because that's who was complaining the loudest about it. You know, so it just made logical sense for, you know, the part of us that's now inside Nancy again to, to do this, to perform this mission. I, I don't remember specifically saying, oh yeah, I'll do it. It, it was just like, understood that that's that was the plan and i accepted now, the mission. was your other ndes was this three during this or was you had others later i had two others um that i call meetings with counsel um my understanding is mm, when you've accepted a mission an incarnated life there are light beings who watch over you and monitor, you know, what you do and, and look out for you. And so I met the first time with um, my counsel. And a lot of times, you know, like when a near death experience or feels like they're being judged, that they, they come before some kind of tribunal and they're being judged. Those are counsel meetings. And it's not really a judgment. You're not like, judged for what you did or failed to do. It's more like, hey, we're keeping track of you and, and you're you're not doing your mission. So that, that first meeting I had with my counsel, they basically said, hey, you know, you're not telling anybody. <laughs> you, you agreed that you're gonna go back to human earth and you're gonna tell people everything. And I wasn't doing it. So it was just kind of like a wake up call. The second one, was another meeting with my counsel. Nancy was dying or had died. I, I don't know which. Um, they basically said, Nancy's dying. You have a choice. You know, you haven't completed your mission, but if you don't want to, you, you know, you don't have to do it. You know, you can come home. No, no harm, no foul. Uh, or in lawyer's language, no breach of contract. Or you can choose to stay with Nancy. If you choose to stay, the two of you will suffer for the rest of her natural life. So I'm thinking, I've never really failed at something big like this. I didn't want to fail source. I didn't want Nancy to suffer. But I felt I owed it to the people who, like me, didn't know all this stuff. So I said, pick me for the suffering. And I went back into Nancy's body and immediately called 911 and went to the hospital. I was in the hospital for three days. Um, it still took a while before I started working on my mission. I uh, did join the International Association of Near-Death Studies and told my afterlife experience for the first time to that group. And I was so ill after that hospitalization that I, I couldn't work for a year. So during that year, I wake up every morning at 4.30 and start writing and I wrote down my memories you know it was all coming back to me I, I, I wrote down and it all came out like in the form of chapters and I had all these chapters laid out on my I had a thousand pages 
of chapters laid out on my kitchen countertop. And I, what am I supposed to do with this? And one morning I woke up with tables of contents for three different books <laughs> for, for all the thousand chapters. Um, and, it, you know, it took a while to get them published. But were you worried about your reputation as an attorney? What people would think of you to talk about something so taboo? Yeah, that's why I didn't tell anybody. Um, I, after that first council meeting where they kind of slapped me up the side of the head and said, get, get with the program, I left my firm. I thought, if I'm going to crash and burn, uh, I don't want to take my partners down with me. I also thought I would have a lot more freedom you know, to be me outside of that environment where it's a good old boys network and you're expected to act and do, you know, certain things. I thought, you know, I would be happier. And I was, I was a lot happier after I left the firm and I continued to practice law and I started, and I came out as a near-death experiencer. And I, I did lose a few clients when I left the firm, uh, some of whom told me they thought I was a flake. Um, but most people didn't care. So it's, it's worked out and I got um, stage three metastatic breast cancer in 2011 and I worked for not quite two years after that and then the treatments just took me down. So here I am working my mission, telling anybody who will listen what I experienced and what I learned. Now you had a third one? The, the third one was the, the second council meeting where that, okay. that, you know, was dying and I called 911 and went to the hospital. And Ooh. then I had three um, near-death experiences um, in the hospital. Uh, the first one was that same hospitalization where you know, Nancy was dying and I met with my council. When I got to the hospital, um, I had that exact same sensation of being somewhere inside my body, but not able to, you know, really manipulate her. I, I could barely move the lips and talk. And I told the doctor, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time staying in the body and I, I'm having a hard time talking. And he said, you're doing just fine. And he sent me down to, um, for an MRI. And while I was uh, laying on a gurney out in the hallway, waiting my turn to go into the MRI machine, I sat up out of the body and looked around and I saw the ER doctor through a couple of walls running down to me with a, an IV in his hand. And he said, I figured out what's wrong with you. You have critically low blood sodium. And so I was in the hospital three days to slowly bring my blood sodium back up to normal level. And then the other two um, near-death experiences in, in the hospital were, one was during my... Um, first surgery in 2019 for cancer. And the other was during my second surgery. And both of those, the, the other people around, you know, the operating room uh, confirmed, you know, what I saw. And the, the second one, I was talking, my uh, anesthesiologist came to visit me uh, after the second round of surgery. Um, she came to visit me in the hospital, which they don't usually do, but I talked to her for 45 minutes. <laughs> before my first surgery and then I requested her for my second round of surgery and, and she came in off her you know off time uh to do my surgery maybe she came in to see me and uh I told her what I had seen in the operating room she goes that's exactly what happened and I said and I I heard somebody say wow that's a beautiful scar and she goes yeah I said that I said I know you did I saw you <laughs> and uh so you know, those, those three in hospital um, NDEs were verified by the people around me. The, the big one in 1994, I was alone. You know, I was, I was alone in that room. I, you know, I was still out of the body when, when the radiologist and radiology technician came back. Um, and they were not inclined to indicate how badly <laughs> I was doing in the medical record. And you also had a shared death experience with your mother? Yes. While she was dying, I was holding her hand. And we had 
practice isn't the right word, but it's, you know, we had talked about death and she'd had a near death experience and I talked about mine and she shared hers. And so we kind of, you know, talked about, you know, what to expect. So when she was dying, I was holding her hand and I could see her, I could see what she was seeing, but she got out of the body and went into darkness and it scared her. And I told her, you know, don't be afraid of the darkness. Just look around for the light. So he would, she was in the darkness and she was panicking and she was looking around for the light and she didn't see it. And so she got back into the body or she tried to get back in the body and she flitted around the room. Like she was just flying around the room. And I thought I was the only one that could see her doing that. But as she got around to the other side of the room, the priest went, <laughs> as she went by him and he said, she's out. Did you know that? <laughs> <He> said, <"Yeah." laughs> I thought that was so strange when he said, she's out. <laughs> she, she went back into the body. And then the second time she, she went into the darkness, she looked for the light and she, she found it. And frankly, I let go of her hand at, you know, before she saw the light because I was afraid she'd take me with her. And I had a mission. And she's come back to me in dreams many times. And sometimes she's wanting to take me with her. But I, Peggy, I struggled so much with Nancy after I got back into the body. She was aware. You know, she knew I'd been gone and that I came back. And she was aware that I'm separate from her. And she was she has been terrified that I will leave her again and she will die. And so I promised her back in 1994, I won't leave you until you're ready. And that's the other reason why at that second council meeting, I said, you know, pick me for the suffering. She hadn't, Nancy hadn't given me an indication that she was ready to go. So I felt obligated to go back to her and stay with her until she was ready. Regardless of what happened. Are are you negative blood? No. Okay. And your mother's not that you know where? No. Okay. I just was curious. When you said your mom had NDE too, I just wondered if something, you know. I've just done these little polls and like 85% of indie ears are negative blood just in my little polls. And so I just been kind of curious, especially if there's a family history of NDEs wondering. But. So when you were talking earlier, this little slogan come to mind, it was like, what do I do? Right. Do? It's like, um, stop accepting and start manifesting. It just it's kind of like the gist of what you were saying like instead of accepting the way a person is or a situation is instead of just accepting it and and being miserable is you know to manifest to create something better yeah i um i got three big knowings about manifesting you know one of them was was when i was actually manifesting those environments but i got one before that and one while i was in source um, the one before that, I was told, you know, it was annoying that all, all I got or all I remember of it was humans really don't understand manifesting. And I remember thinking to myself, what's that to me? <laughs> you know, then I started manifesting myself in the afterlife. And then I got that big bolus of knowing about everything's manifested. And then when I was in source, um, I got, you know, more information, you know, that's, one of, I've got there were 50, 50 bazillion things I learned in the afterlife. One of them is that we understand more the, as we go through different phases. Like the phase of eternal life from which we incarnate is a fairly ignorant phase. We don't, we have access to what I call universal knowledge. We have access to all the knowings we could ever want, but we don't understand them very well. It's not until we're actually ready to awaken a source that we get full understanding. And, you know, these 
eight or 10, I, I've never counted them, other afterlife experiencers who are like myself, who experience source as energy, all, every one of them agree that we are source. We collectively are source. Part of source separates itself out and goes down and plants itself into physical matter somewhere in the universe as a soul. And, and then when that physical matter says bye-bye, we go back and become source again. So that's what I mean by this is what life is. It's all one circle. It's not this. This is human thinking. This is source's reality. We are all one consciousness. The bodies are manifested by source. The souls are source of self-awareness. That's, that's what I came back to tell people. How did this change your Catholic view? I mean, from what you believe as a Catholic, and not to say that it took away your religion, but you know, I mean. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it took away religion. You know, I, it took me seven years to get my feet back under me after that 1994 uh, experience, because everything I'd ever believed was gone. I mean, I had new beliefs and they were far more beautiful and wonderful and comforting. Oh my gosh, I was so relieved to find out that I don't have to be on any particular path to get back to source. I am source. I don't have to watch my P's and Q's. I'm not going to be judged. And now I'm not going to go out and you know kill somebody or do things that I wouldn't approve of from my own personal moral values. But it just took the weight off of me of always trying to figure out What's the right thing to do? What's the best thing to do? How do I stay on my path? You know, how do I not sin? You know, all that was just gone. So I tell people now, religion is about faith. Faith is when you believe something with absolutely no proof that it is true. I have knowledge. I don't need faith. Yeah. So I said after mine, it's like before my NDE, I believed in God. When I came back from my NDE, I knew there was God. Oh. You know, it's like seeing is believing. Except that there's still so many people who don't believe. Yeah. And, you know, as we mentioned before, I introduced you is we both agree people just aren't getting this. They can watch a hundred of these, a thousand of these NDEs, but I really don't think they're getting it. Well, the, you know, and that big download of information I got about humans and what they're, what they're like, you know, they're animals. And they're really no different than dogs or cats or horses or pigs or cows or, you know, lions or tigers. Humans are predatory. They are superstitious. They are fearful. They, they need a comfort zone. Uh, and they get very fearful of anything that challenges their comfort zone because they're, you know, survival. Humans, like other animals, are, are geared for survival. That's all they're interested in. And so when you take um, knowledge about eternal life, about the universe, about source, and give it to somebody who's in a little comfort zone that they've created, you know, over their lifetime, that's, you know, religious or spiritual beliefs or whatever it is that they've come to believe. That's a real threat to their comfort. That's, that's scary. It scared me. I mean, I, I spent the first two years back in this body, not wanting to believe it. I wanted my Catholic religion back because that was my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I did not want to believe the truth. I knew it was true but I, I had a hard time accepting it. So I don't blame anybody who's not willing to accept it. What I tell people is, you'll see. And, you know, one of my readers um, told me once, well, Nancy, you know, if I believe everything you're saying, the worst that can happen to me is I'll just go back and be source. If I, no, he said, if, if he doesn't believe everything I say, the worst that can happen to him is, He'll go back and be source. But if he doesn't believe religion, the worst thing that could happen to him is he can go to hell. He says, so I'm going to hedge my bets. 
and go with religion. But, you know, when I ask my seven questions, you know, where is hell? There's no hell. And I, in fact, when I watch the creation of the universe as source, and as myself, I saw that there, there was nothing but source before the universe was created. There was no hell. There were no creatures. There were no things, no demons, no nothing. There was nothing out there. And then source created the universe and did not create a Satan or a hell or a devil or demons or. Yeah. And if nothing else, you know, I hope these stories uh, wake people up to things like you told your doctor you're leaving your body. I'm leaving my body. He's like, you're, you're okay. You know, all of us need to start to see that as a red flag. If you're ever feeling like you're leaving your body or that you've, you're floating or you've had any kind of experience, start to use that as a red flag. Am I okay physically? What is happening here? And don't dismiss it if just because your doctor dismisses it or if everybody else around you dismisses it. We need to like, you know, when I was at 25 and I wanted to pick up that blue ball in my lap because they're pushing me down through the emergency room in a wheelchair and uh, I lost contact with my body. You know, if I could, if that happened to me today, I hope I would be really vocal instead of keeping that to myself, kind of like ashamed because that's so weird thing to say that like, wait a minute here. I'm about dead. I can't, I've lost contact with my body. You know, and a couple of years ago, I was at the dentist office and they just give me this little numbing thing for my tooth. No laughing gas as the other dentist office used to do. And all of a sudden I was like, what did you put in that? Did you give me some narcotic? And they think, no, why? It's just numbing. I said, because I'm floating here. It's just like you just gave me a narcotic and I'm just really out of myself. And they started checking my blood pressure. My blood pressure is always low, was now real high and climbing. So they called the squad and thought I was having a heart attack because I'm fat. Everybody thinks I'm having a heart attack. You know, my heart's good. But the medical community, every time I have a high blood pressure or something, like she must be having a heart attack. I'm like, honestly, they've checked my heart. It's really good. But um, so they rushed me down and so they, you know, rushed me in this gurney in the emergency room thinking I'm having this heart attack. And I said, if this is what a heart attack feels like, <laughs> then I've been misinformed because I thought it was painful. I said, I'm the opposite of pain. I'm just so like woozy, not woozy, but I'm floating. I feel no anxiety. I feel no pain. I feel like I'm kind of floating here out of my body. And and they all kind of laugh. Says, well, you're fine then. But, you know. But then I'm thinking, am I fine? Because my experience tells me if I'm kind of floating out of my body, something's not good here. And all they did was give me a numbing thing. So I just think after, you know, like you've had one NDE, it seems like we're more likely to have another. We're more likely to have out of body. We're more likely to have this shared death experience. We're more likely to be set up now to have these things. And, um, and I just think anybody that's had an NDE needs to be aware that that might not be just a one-time thing. Like it's almost like a crack in an egg is open and, and this might, like we have this connection now and, yeah. you know, voices may come in and tell us things. Those, those guides, those, those spirits, wherever they are, we had connection with on the other side. It's like, we're going to, the dials turned up. We're going to hear that better, louder now, clearer. Yeah, I've been back in the afterlife uh, a few times um, while I was still in Nancy's body. Like I had another life review uh, while during meditation. I mean, I, I was started out meditating, and I was back in the afterlife having a life review that included Nancy's future. And then I, um, while I was writing my book, Backwards Beliefs, I was back in the afterlife, and I got this huge download of knowings about that was everything that humans had ever written. Every homework paper, every slip of paper that you stick on the refrigerator, every phone message, every book, every play, every, you know, everything that had ever been written in all human life, had it all in my mind all at one time. And when I got back into my body after that, I felt like I'd been electrocuted. 
it took a long time to get over that. Um, so I totally agree with you that once, see, the afterlife's a state of awareness. And once you've reached a certain state of awareness, you can go back there. You, you can reach that state of awareness again. It's not a place. It's. And what state. amazes me too, you know, like every movie or, you know, anytime anybody dies, um, you see them like the light just go out of their eyes. So they stop moving and they say they're gone. And then we have scientists thinking this is all brain and body is like, we intuitively know when someone's gone. We know something just left here. Something that existed no longer exists. But yet it seems to be such a mystery that, you know, where does consciousness come from? And, you know, it's in the brain and, and all this stuff is like, but, but just watch, you know, the act of someone just, you know, they're dead. Oh, they're gone. You know, like, you know, my mother-in-law when she passed, like, oh, she's gone now. And, and you just visualize this person has just like walked out of the room. Mm -hmm. But yet, well, I don't know why science is so hung up on, oh, this is just brain and it's chemical and all this stuff. And then when they come back, you know, you take this gas of air and, and they're telling this story. It's like, why is this so unbelievable? You just know they were gone. So where were they? And now they're back. You know, they're back in the body. Why is it so hard to understand that this soul just leaves and comes back or leaves and now they're gone and then that is not the body the body's still laying there the brain is still in the head so i you know i don't know if i'm making sense but well you are making sense but you know there's a huge field of medical research near-death experiences and in my next book i'm going to, to cover uh actually kind of what you just said i'm i have chapters on the the afterlife experiencers who like myself went very deep into the afterlife who lived there who who went much farther than than the average near-death experience and i i learned in the afterlife that um i see i always wanted to be a scientist i was going to go to medical school um, so i think that's why i got this information that scientists are generally fearful people they use science as a comfort food. Um, they create theories that are inside the box and then they prove their theory and that keeps them in their box and they don't ever get outside the box um, because they're uncomfortable with that. But their job is to bring us knowledge and information about the physical world. You know, so they're doing their job. They're, they're, advancing mankind and they're advancing you know knowledge by doing their job studying the physical world it's they look at it as it's not their job to study the spiritual world and and that makes sense to me what doesn't make sense to me is that all these nde researchers who believe the human-like afterlife experiences but they don't believe the ones that are not human-like. Now, I know why it is that way, because they're thinking like animals. But, you know, most afterlife experiences, you know, the, the person will describe, you know, gardens or, or meadows or crystal. Those are all manifestations. Those are the soul. See, we manifest every moment of, of human life, of physical life. And we don't stop manifesting just because we get out of the body. So we start manifesting instantly once we're out of the body and we manifest into physical reality what we truly and deeply believe. So a person who truly and deeply believes in Jesus will manifest the apparition of Jesus when they cross over. Somebody who truly and deeply believes in Buddha will manifest the apparition of, of, the, of Buddha when they cross over. Somebody who truly and deeply believes that heaven is a beautiful garden with, you know, wonderful music will manifest that those manifestations disappear if you're if you're there long enough just like those three manifestations i created they disappear um and the manifestations that other near-death experiencers have would disappear too if they were there longer they just weren't there very long they weren't long enough to get they were there long enough to get past that that stage 
it would be nice if us in the ears could get together and have a class action lawsuit, not for money and damages, but for awareness to the medical community that we need at least on the, when a person comes in to the ER or the doctor's office and being triaged that to add that one question, have you had a spiritual experience recently? Or if you do let us know, because, you know, so many times people feel, well, I'm about to leave my body. I feel like I'm dying. And we just get dismissed. Those feelings are just dismissed. Just like me at 25 in 1986, I could not bring the words out of my mouth to save my life and tell my doctor I was just in heaven accepting it. And now I'm back and you want to discharge me and send me home. I couldn't say that. Yeah. All I could say was, he says, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Well, I knew that wasn't true because I was just dead in heaven. No, I mean, I, I respect your doctor's opinion, but yeah, you know, but I couldn't have the words to say that because I thought they'd put me in a psych ward. So I just said, I'm not going home. And he looked at my husband like, what's wrong with her? And he said, well, if it make you feel better, you can spend the night since you live an hour away. But he says, there's nothing wrong with you. So he, you know, he walked away today. You know, if a woman come in with those same symptoms, if she knew this stuff we're talking about, you know, it would be nice if she would be able to say what I couldn't then. Wait a minute. I had one of those near-death experience things in your hallway. So I'm about dead here. So you need to do some more tests right now. You know, because, you know, be able to verbalize and have the language. Um, and even, you know, when we feel we're leaving our body or, or suddenly we can't lift our hands or or we just had this um, experience in the emergency squad, but we were hovering over the squad or we were with aunt, our grandma or our uncle or whatever, you know, what I mean? to be able to recognize, to bring awareness and to, and to validate these experiences to say, this should be just the same as um, I have chest pain. It should be just the same as um, I'm bleeding out somewhere, you know, this should be another um, uh, an example of someone is almost in, in death here, you know, because yeah. they happen in the hospital too. I've yeah, you know, yeah, interviewed people, the hospital yeah, you know, like you, you're in the I, hospital and you have this I, I, I'm getting out of my body and, and so the doctor figures, oh, there must be something wrong with their brain. <laughs> yeah. They're not getting it. They're too busy thinking we're all weirdos to listen to the science because there are so many cases of us, you know, I, you know, I've had, you know, people's had COVID and, you know, only have been you know, a few chance, you know, a few percentage chance to live. And this one guy, he was the only one on the whole ward that didn't die of COVID, you know, and they've had this experience and they come back, but they were not able to communicate with the nurses to, to alert them. You know, they could say it. I, Hey, I was just dead. And they just, go on about their shift. It, you know, it seems like there needs to be a bell being rung here saying, um, doctor, this patient just said he, he just felt like he was dead. He had some experience and the doctor should be able to get in there and get eyes on him. What's going on here? That should be an alert, but it's not. It's a roll the eyes, dismiss. You're fine. Like they told you, you're fine. And, and these are alerts that, that they're just missing. Well, you know, the, the very brave doctors like, you know, um, Bruce Grayson and Jeff Long and, and Sam Parnia and, you know, the whole raft of them that are in near, uh, Ions, you know, they've done research, they've documented, they've proven that this is a real phenomenon and they still have trouble convincing their medical peers. So, you know, the, the work's being done. It's just, you know, like I told you before, Humans have comfort zones and they don't want those comfort zones challenged, even to hear something better, you know, even to hear something more comforting. They just don't want change. I just and wish that we could get this stuff in universities and not in a parapsychology, not in, you know, with witchcraft, you know, but to actual, you know, study when you had this experience 
was you able to communicate with any medical personnel to then did they change how they were treating you based on that? And you know, then you went on and died, you know, where maybe this could have been prevented if somebody would have listened. You know, I, I died when I was left alone during that needle localization procedure. In 2011, when I had the exact same procedure in the exact same hospital, they did the exact same thing. They left me alone for half an hour, 20 minutes at a time. They're not I, had told them. I had told them, you know, but they're still doing it. Yeah. Again, you know, my mother-in-law, when she was on her deathbed and I walked in the living room and uh, my sister-in-law said, Mom said grandma was just here, which is grandma's passed away. You know, grandma was just here and told mom not to get in a hurry. And I knew immediately what that meant. I knew we were on short time here where I'm sure if she was in a hospital, they wouldn't consider that as anything significant. Well, I think it was a symptom of uh, dementia. Yeah. You know, lower her morphine drip or whatever. But, but then, then again, so many nurses do know this stuff because I've been in hospitals with various people visiting and we get talking to the nurses and they're very well aware of yeah. these things. I think, uh, I think ER doctors and anesthesiologists are, are more aware too. It's like my, my uh, breast cancer surgeon who did both all three rounds of surgery uh, still says I hallucinated. But my anesthesiologist says, oh, we hear stories like this all the time. Um, a few years ago, I went to my doctor's office. I took my husband with me. And after my exam, the nurse is still in the room. I said, there's been something I've been wanting to tell you for 30 years. And he said, well, you better tell me then. So I told him the brief version of my NDE, because he's the one that did my dual pregnancy surgery, that said that I was fine. And the next morning, he realized I had internal bleeding you know, everywhere. And so I told him the brief version. I said, I want you to know why I didn't, why I refused to go home that night because of you know, the experience I had in the wheelchair and et cetera. And he says, I believe what you're telling me. He says, I have come to believe in my years of practice of what you're telling me. And the nurse says, oh, he does too. You know, he didn't in 1986, but he does now. Well, there, yeah, there wasn't much known in 1986. Right. right. And, and, and I understand, I, I mean, I've always would still continue to be faithful. You're going to this doctor, you're in 30 years, I went to him, well, more than that now. Um, because I don't blame him because he told me, he says, Peggy, it, both twins were in the uterus when I was at the, uh, his office before the adulterous sound. So for me to come in and say, I think it's a tool of pregnancy is not, I did it at ultrasound, but when he did the, uh, ultrasound while I was in the hospital the next morning, he saw that one was in the, one baby was in the uterus. The other was trapped in the tube. And that was why. And he told me on a six weeks checkup, you taught me to listen to my patients over my machines. And I thought, well, can't we get all doctors to do that? <laughs> you know, start listening to your patients. And I know you, what your medical training tells you. And, um, but if they're saying that they just was out of their body or had some supernatural experience, or I feel like I'm about to die, listen, take another closer look. Because we do get those, I don't want to say even intuitions, because they're not even that, they're experiences um, that they give us knowledge that no doctor can have, that we couldn't even have if we hadn't had it. Yeah. Well, thank you. i got to go eat lunch. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. It's been very interesting. So um, I hope somebody hears this, that maybe if they have an experience, they will, you know, maybe it'll save somebody's life, that they'll speak up. Hope so too. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Bye.